Mark chapter 5, verse 21. I'm not going to read all of 21 through 43, but I'm going to read it as we go through the passage. But I am going to start out with the first couple of verses, and uh, we'll pray. We'll see what the, God, what the Lord has for us this day. It says, Jesus had crossed over again in a boat to the other side. A large crowd gathered around him, so they stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and seeing him, fell at his feet, and employed him earnestly, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come, lay your hands on her, so that she will get well and live. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for this day. Thank you again for your mercy. Thank you again for who you are. And God, that we can trust you, that we can lean on your word, that we can hope in your word, and that we can read and know that your word is true and it's unchanging. God, thank you for the, again for this morning. And Lord, as we look at this passage, I pray, God, that you'd open the eyes of our heart, that we could see and understand and know you more, that we could catch a glimpse of heaven today. Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like a deadly virus, sin has a devastating effect on every human being. Every human being, all of us. Romans tells us that it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And its influence is destructive, causes sickness, suffering, and ultimately death. That's what the scripture tells us. It says, for the wages of sin is death. And this is what Jairus is dealing with. That sin... Adam's disobedience in the garden introduced sin into this world. And his descendants, that would be you and I, have all inherited this disease. We've all inherited this disease. Romans 12, uh, excuse me, 512 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered in the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. The fear of death is, is universal. It's the fear of the unknown. You know, a, as a believer, we hope in heaven. We have that trust that one day after on the other side that we're going to be with the Lord. That's our hope. We look forward to that. I look forward to that. But that doesn't mean that I'm still not leery of that day when I die. It's a real thing. And if you're a non-believer here today, you don't have that hope. And that's the, the fearful thing. You know, that is the fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And I encourage you, if you hear nothing else today, hear this. You know, we've always tried to escape death. But it's appointed. Can't get away from it. Just can't get away from it. And Jairus was dealing with that that day. He was dealing with that that day. Uh, we were here yesterday, and a family was dealing with that that day. Death is as much a part of life as birth. And we need to we need to understand this. We need to know. I know we know this, but we don't talk about. It. We celebrate, and it's happy. It's joyful when babies are born, and when kids graduate and all these things. But you know what? Yesterday we had a home going and they were celebrating. That the de desire was to worship God. And that's how we should see things. That's how we should see when a believer passes. They cross into eternity with the Lord. Now here's the question that we're going to try to answer today. There's a couple of questions that we're going to try to answer today. And I don't have all the answers but I have the answer to this question. It says, in all of human history, has anyone conquered death and in do so doing made it possible for others to triumph over it? And we in all, if you're here and you know the Lord, you know the answer to that question. It is yes. There is a person who has conquered death and his name is Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's why our hope is not here. That's why our hope is in heaven. There is a deliverer, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John 11 tells us, Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, 
even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have life more abundantly. Jesus personally defeated death through the, his resurrection, and the resurrection, when you read the Gospels, the resurrection is written in all four of the Gospels. It is the death. We always talk about the cross. We always talk about the death. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the difference between Jesus and all the others. He has the power over sin and death. That is the difference. No. Well, <laughs> he's also God. But the resurrection shows. And this resurrection was verified. People saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. It was witnessed by 500. It was witnessed by a bunch of people. It wasn't just something done in secret. It was publicly displayed for all to see and all can know. And the gospel proclaims the truth that in his resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ conquered death, not only for himself, but for all who believe. And that's why it's so important you hear today, I always talk about, are you believing? Not did you believe 1985, but are you believing today? Are you trusting in God today for your salvation? Are you hoping in God today for your salvation? Yes, for me, 1985 was an important day because it was the first time I was introduced to the Lord. And 1986 was important, 1987, and every year after that was important, but today is just as important as then. Because are you believing today? And that's the question every one of you here needs to ask yourself, and every one of you needs to answer that question. And I hope you can say yes I am. And I understand, you know, okay, I don't, I don't do all things. I'm not perfect. But you know what? I'm going forward. I'm going forward with the, with the Lord. And as a preview of his own resurrection, Jesus raised a number of people. We read scripture, raised a number of people from the dead. There was a lady, excuse me, a son of a widow of man in, in Luke 7, Lazarus. John 11, raised from the dead. And here in this passage, Jairus' daughter. And we're going to talk about that later on uh, today. And at the end of chapter 4 and here in chapter 5, there are two events, two stories that reveal the power of Jesus. Mark, Mark 4, 35 through 41, Jesus displays his authority over nature with a word. When he spoke to the storm, and the storm was still, amazement covered in, was in that boat. Can you imagine being in a storm, and all of a sudden, um, this man named Jesus stands up, speaks a word, and the whole place becomes calm. This is a power over nature. The next day, his disciples... Uh, he displayed his uh, authority to his disciples over the supernatural forces by casting out the legion of demons. And I know Pastor Chris talked about that. He spoke a word, and this man who was bound by chains that couldn't hold him was living in the, in the cemeteries. He was set free by the power of Jesus' words. And in this passage today, verse 21 through 43, Jesus exercises his miraculous power over both disease. We're going to talk about a lady who had a, uh, an issuing of blood for 12 years over disease and over death. Jairus' daughter was dead, wasn't asleep, just like Lazarus wasn't asleep. He was dead. Not only did he heal the woman 12-year illness, he also raised the little girl. So let's look at this passage. Let's put our heads around this. And I'm going to read verses 21 through 24. Read it again. And, and like I said, I'm going to try to read through the pa this passage as we go along. This is verse 21 through 24. 
It says, when Jesus had crossed over in the boat to the other side, a large crowd around, uh, a large crowd gathered around him, so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and seeing him fell at his feet and employed him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. You know, unlike many religious leaders, and I have to confess because I'm like this, I tend to be an introvert. And I, I go hide. I'm around people all the time. And I go hide. And unlike religious leaders, myself included, and religious leaders of this day, Jesus didn't isolate himself. Spent three years in public. Yes, he got away for times of, uh, of retreat and times of prayer and times of teaching his disciples. But he was publicly displayed before a large crowd almost all the time. His entire ministry was spent surrounded by crowds. And like I said, it was only an occasional retreat into isolation for the purpose of prayer, rest, and teaching his disciples. Reminding them, okay, what did you mean by that, Jesus? And he was there to share with them, this is what the, uh, I was talking about. And in the first part of chapter 5, verses 20 through 21, Jesus cast out a legion of demons of a man. The residents in in this area were frightened by the display of his power. They begged him to leave. And Jesus honored their request, and he and his disciples crossed over again in a boat to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when they arrived there, they were greeted by another large crowd. And in Luke, same same. Same story in Luke chapter 8. It says the people welcomed him for they, were, they had all been waiting for him. They were anticipating Jesus coming and they were waiting. And I'm sure in this crowd, uh, uh, those that were waiting for him, there included those that were suffering from various diseases and disabilities, hoping, hoping that he would heal them. I mean, if I was Jairus, I would have ran to Jesus. And I knew he could help me. I would have ran. Let me ask you another question. Are you eagerly waiting for Jesus? Or are you just going through life? It's a real question. When you get up in the morning... Are you, are you anticipating a divine encounter with the creator of heaven and earth? When you come to church, are you anticipating God is going to intervene in your life? I mean, it's a real question. And you know what? I, I have to confess, all too often I'm not. All too often I am so consumed. When I get here in the morning, i got a thousand things to do. My mind is already, before I even arrive in this parking lot, I've already thought through about 20 things i got to do in the first 10 minutes. I mean, it's just <laughs> what it is. Are you eagerly waiting for Jesus when you wake up in the morning? When you open scripture and you're reading stories, these aren't stories. This is God's character written on pages so you can know the creator of the universe. That's what this is. And so when you open scripture, are you eagerly waiting? These folks, were, they were wanting to be healed. They wanted a physical healing. Jesus wanted a spiritual healing. That's why he came. He didn't come just to heal and make everybody well. He came to change so people can be restored to the relationship that had fallen, that had been lost in the garden. And Mark's account forces or or focuses forces us to focus on two individuals in this crowd that were eagerly waiting they desperately needed the lord they had little in common other than their need the first was Jairus we've already read a little bit about Jairus and in a minute we're going to read about the lady with the issuing of blood Jairus was a synagogue official and given the hostility between Jesus 
that he had received from Israel's religious establishments. I'm sure the disciples were pretty shocked when they saw this man named Jairus, a synagogue official, coming up and bowing down before Jesus. I mean, somebody that doesn't like you, I mean, I like you, but I don't think I would do that. And here he is, this man named Jairus, animosity, hatred. He had heard, I'm sure he had heard all the stories, all the healings. And his baby, his little girl, was sick to the point of death, and he knew where help was at. And it's possible that the synagogue in which Jesus cast out the demon in Mark chapter 1 was the same synagogue where Jairus uh, uh, worked or was stationed, or at least was in that area. Nonetheless, we know that Jairus had heard all about this man. We know that he had heard all about this man. The passage says, making his way through the crowd to Jesus, Jairus came up and seeing him fell at his feet. Matthew, same story, Matthew chapter 9, it says that Jairus bowed down And when you look at this word, it implies worship. The word bow down implies worship. So Jairus came up. I don't know if he recognized that Jesus was the Son of God. I don't know what he was thinking, but it says he came up and he bowed down. He worshiped, implying that he did know. And he, Jairus, employed him earnestly, saying, My little daughter's at the point of death. Please come. Lay your hands on her so she can live. So he went off, though a large crowd was following him and pressing. This is important. A large crowd was pressing in on him. And Jesus began his journey through the street of Capernaum to Jairus' house. Jesus is accessible. He's not only then, but today. He is accessible. And if you have a need, he's there. If you need something, he's there. If you need a a personal touch, he's there. You can take him at his word. He's there. let's, Let's go on. Let's read verses 25 through 34. It says, A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years had endured much from the hands of many physicians and spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she thought, if I just touch his garment, I'll get well. Immediately the flow of blood, flow of her blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed from her affliction. It says immediately she knew it. And then that word here again is used. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around to the crowd and said, Who touched me? And the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? He looked around again to see the woman who had done this, But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed from your affliction. You know, as Jairus was escorting Jesus back to his house, you know, I'm I'm sure... (laughs) I'm sure he was feeling joy. It's like, yes, my daughter. My daughter's going to be good. Everything's going to be okay. All of a sudden, there was an interruption. And if I was Jairus, I would be grabbing hold of uh, Jesus' arm and say, come on, dude, let's go. And, And Jesus intentionally stopped, ministered to a lady. In the crowd was a woman who had a hemorrhage of 12 years hands of many physicians. It's been all she had. Only got worse. I know some of us, we we understand this. Some of us have done some of this. 
So we, we know what this woman only got worse. You know, in some ways, this woman was the opposite of Jairus. He was highly respected in the synagogue. She was a social outcast. I mean, think with me. Because of her condition, 12 years, she was unclean. She was been ostracized from the Jewish re- religious community. They did have one thing in common. They both knew that Jesus was their only hope. The cause of of this woman's problem, the blood, was not stated. We don't know what caused this. Uh, Her repeated attempts to uh, to get cured failed. And no matter how many doctors she consulted, spent all she had, there was no solution here. More than a decade, it says 12 years, this woman experienced no reprieve. Meaning she would, think about this. She was, because of her condition, she was unclean. She couldn't go to church. She couldn't go to fellowships. She couldn't go to potlucks. She couldn't go to nothing. She was like a leper. Almost to the point of being a leper because she was unclean and she was not allowed in the temple. That's, that's, what this woman is going through. And it was she was going through it for 12 years. More than a decade, she had been ostracized. And after hearing about Jesus, I know she had heard about it. The whole countryside had heard about this man named Jesus. She discern, determined to find him, believing he would deliver her. He, she, he was her only hope. And she pressed her way through the crowd, violating the boundaries of those who were ceremonially unclean. In finding Jesus, she came up, but she didn't want want anybody to know. That's what scripture tells you. She didn't want anybody, she didn't want to make the big to-do out of it. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I could just touch his garment, I'll get well. If I could just get close enough, I'll be well. Hoping to avoid being noticed, she came just to get close enough to touch the fringe of his cloak. That's what Luke 8 tells us. And as Mark records, immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed from her afflictions. The moment she touched his garment, her body was restored. And how many of you want to be healed from an, uh, an illness. I mean, we've all, I've got it. I've got something that I've been going through since I was six years old. I really want it. And I'm sure some of you have illnesses that you've had for as long as I have. I mean, for me, it's 51 plus, 51 years. What are you doing about it? Are you seeking God? I I can't promise you that Jesus is going to heal you. I I can't. But how bad do you want to seek the Lord? He's your only hope. He's your only hope for salvation. He's your only hope for healing. He's your only hope for physical healing. He's your only hope for spiritual healing. So how bad are you seeking after him? I, again, I'm going to confess. I'll confess for us because all too often I find myself carried away by the, the glitz and glamour of the world. Stuff that I think is important, but in the end just carries me away farther from the Lord. How many of you want to be healed? The woman sought the Lord. Her life depended on it. Being in church, here, fellowship, being ceremonially clean at that time depended on it. And she did everything she knew to seek God to find a cure. Jesus had a purpose for this woman's life, and it went beyond the physical healing. Yeah, there's a physical healing We all need the, I need the physical healing, but you know what's more important than the physical is the spiritual healing. 
I need my heart transformed. I need my mind renewed. I need that daily, and I need that far more than the physical, because the physical is going to die. The physical is going to be is going to just lose its ability. I need the spiritual renewed. I need the spiritual healing. I need my mind renewed every day. And the only way that happens is if I seek after the Lord. And so, again, I ask that question, what are you doing about it? You know what you need. You know what you should do, but what are you doing? That's the question we all have to ask. And Jesus, knowing her spiritual condition still needed to be addressed, he turned to her in the crowd and said, Who touched my garment? And his disciples didn't understand what he was doing. Uh, looking around, they said, you see the crowd? You know, you see how many people? It's like a basketball game when you're exiting. They're a crowd. They're, everybody was packed in, and there's everybody around. And, and the word for this word pressing implies that it was a crowd, and Jesus was crammed in. Not like we're, we're kind of spread out here. Think about everybody in this room all being in that section right over there. That's kind of the way I look at this. I mean, and we're all moving down the, down the streets. We were crammed in there. And the obvious question was asked where uh, there were so many people in so close a proximity to Jesus that it seemed impossible to find out that single person. Who was this one person? But the Lord knew precisely who he was referring to. And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. And she wanted to hide. She wanted to get in and get out and not be noticed. But he was speaking to her. And the woman fearing, this is what scripture tells us, the woman fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. For the past 12 years, she had been an outsider. Now she could come, fall down, and worship the Lord publicly. And she told the whole truth about her sickness and her healing. Again, what are you doing? And the Lord here responds to her confession. You know, when you seek after the Lord, when you, when you pursue God, and you are, are honestly seeking after the God, you're going to find him. It might be a little different from what you think, but you're going to find him. And not only are you going to get physical healing, you're going to get spiritual healing. That's the good part. And the Lord responded to her confession by affirming her realness of her faith. And he said to, the, said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed from your affliction. That's what he tells this lady. Well, we move on, verses 35 and through 40. And all along, think about this, all along Jairus was pulling on his arm. My daughter, come on, my daughter, my daughter. And I don't know how long this, this incident happened, but Jairus was wanting him to get to his house. In verse 35, it says, it says, While they were still speaking, a crowd from the house of the synagogue official came saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was what had been spoken by the synagogue to the synagogue official, told him, "Do not be afraid any longer; only believe." And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the synagogue official, and they saw a commotion. And people loudly weeping and wailing and entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but asleep. They began laughing at him, but he put them all out, and he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered into the room where the child was. We don't, again, we don't know how long Jesus' interaction with this woman took. It lasted long enough for this child to be seen as dead and for mourners to come and begin the funeral procession or the funeral service 
So we, we don't know how long it took. Again, I've just, I could just see Jairus pulling Jesus down the road. Get here now. And while uh, uh, they were still speaking, men came up and said, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Seemed that the delay cost Jairus, just like it cost Mary and Martha. And he'd heard the news from home, and the suggestion is that the messenger was that Jesus had wasted time. In my own heart, I would have thought, you know, Jesus, if you had only been here, Lazarus would have been alive. Jesus, if you had only been here, my daughter wouldn't have died. If you had only come with me, my daughter would have, would have lived. Now it's too late. So it seemed. Now it was too late. Why trouble the teacher anymore? And in both cases, Lazarus and this, uh, surrounded by fear. Surrounded by fear, Jesus spoke words. Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. In Luke 8, Jesus adds the promise. Same story. In Luke 8, he adds the promise. It says, it says she will be made well. Don't fear. Don't struggle. Only believe. When he arrived, the funeral was underway. The journey to the house had taken long enough for the mourners to assemble. Mod you know, the, the difference between modern day, most modern day funerals is it's very subdued, very quiet, somber. Uh, I was about to say relaxed, but probably not relaxed. But here, I, 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 was, I did a funeral in Moldova. It was anything but. I mean, it was very raw, very open. And it was in the, in the building in which they lived. They just came right down to the street, and there's where the funeral was taking place. Same thing here. It's very open, very loud, very non-Western, if I can say it that way. But when he entered the house, he allowed no one to accompany him but Peter, James, and John, James's brother. And when they arrived, the funeral was underway. Uh, and so when Jesus arrived at Jairus' house, the scene was chaotic, loud. He was unfazed by uh, the mayhem. He entered and said, why the commotion? And according to Matthew and Luke, Jesus told the mourners to stop weeping and to leave. And I'm sure the mourners were startled. And Jesus broke the silence, saying to them, the child's not dead, but asleep. And instantly, their mourning turned into mockery. They started laughing at him. They began laughing at him. Their, their, their pretend grief, superficial at best, instantly turned to mockery. Uh, the, they knew the girl was dead. They found it ridiculous to claim that she was only sleeping. Undeterred by this, this laughter, they put them all out. He took the... the, the Child's parents and his companions, they entered into the child's room. And here's where it all happens. Verse 41 through 43, it says, Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Tabitha Kum, which translates, Little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl began, uh, got up and began to walk around, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astonished. And he gave them strict orders not to tell anyone about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. You know, Jesus had already demonstrated his, his kindness to Jairus and the multitude in a lot of different ways. He, he granted him a personal audience. He granted Jairus a personal audience. He agreed to go with him. Didn't have to go with him. Uh, he reassured, he reassured Jairus that his daughter would be okay. Uh, he took charge of the situation at Jairus' house. And the Lord healed the daughter. It says immediately, touched her, and immediately 
killed the little girl, and the girl got up. The young woman was dead one moment, and she was alive the next. There was no time for recovery, rehabilitation, physical therapy. It was immediate. It happened. Like all of us, Jesus' miracles uh, was a creative work. Its effects were immediate, complete, and in this case, undeniable, just like with Lazarus. You know, we're about to sing a song, and that song, there is power in the blood. And I sing this song, I, I know it from years ago in Spanish. There's power, there's power, there's wonder-working power. And if you're here and you need God to intervene in your life, you know there's power in the blood, if you want it. If you need healing, there's power in the blood, if you want it. If you're willing to seek after the Lord. Maybe, maybe you're here and you have a besetting sin. Maybe you hear pornography is huge in our culture. Gossip's huge in our culture. You know what? You want victory over that sin? There's power in the blood. And as we sing this song, you can ask the Lord to heal you, to deliver you, to minister to you, not just physical healing, but spiritual healing as well. If you're here and you're not believing... You're here and you, ha you trusted Christ a long time ago, but your life today doesn't reflect that. There's power in the blood. It can happen today. It can happen today. Yeah, gossip, it says it's like as witchcraft. I mean, it's, I, wow. There's power in the blood. And as we sing today, as the musicians come and we sing, you can trust God to intervene in your life. And afterwards, somebody's going to be in the library. Somebody will be in the library. If you need, you need somebody to pray for you, myself, one of the elders, Zach, somebody's going to be in the library. If somebody's in the library, we'll, go, we'll find a place. But you know what? Don't leave today without that spiritual, without that physical touch, without meeting Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that there's power in the blood. Thank you, God, for your goodness, who you are. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in this room, and, and I just pray for us. I pray, God, that we would earnestly, that we would seek after you like nothing else, that our heart's desire would be to know you, to find out who you are, to understand your character and allow that to permeate our souls. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name.